Good morning. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Karen. I'm here to talk to you about contamination. I'm sorry it's not the most interesting topic to most people, but it's really important. And I was just going to go through a project that we're working on. It's very much in development um, as a start of a conversation of how we can possibly standardise contamination data. So just a bit of a background, um, obviously I work for the UK Health uh, Safe Security Agency, um, which is the government public health arm. Um, our division, uh, which is very long-winded, um, generally deals with um, antimicrobial resistance. We um, provide a national reference service. We look into uh, mechanisms of AMR. Uh, we also um, identify, uh, detect, and type uh, microbial pathogens, and we provide uh, bi bioinformatic support for uh, outbreak investigations. So today I'm here obviously to talk about contamination. Um, we all know it happens, we all know how it happens and where and why, um, but today I want to construct on how we can um, catch it analytically in our sequencing data after it's happened, and also discuss um, the uh, threshold, so um, what we can tolerate in our sequencing data before it starts to affect our results. So we can build in catches for contamination and ensure that we have accuracy and confidence in our results. So this is a project we're working on. Um, the Opportunistic Pathogen Typing Service has been a service that has provided uh, NHS hospitals with bacterial typing for many years through pulse field gel electrophoresis, so a wet lab um, technique. Um, that has been happily running um, until May last year, a decision was made due to the PFG uh, equipment aging and becoming critical, um, that an alternative would be built using whole gene sequencing and a bioinformatic pipeline. Um, now that's fine, but in the last few years alone, the Opportunistic Pathogen Typing Service has seen over 140 different species from 33 genera. So building a pipeline for typing that variety of pathogen is a little bit of a headache. Um, we have identified, though, that 60% are generally um, Enterococcus, Burkholderia, Enterobacter, Serratia. These are our repeat offenders. So um, to start looking at how we look into contamination in our pipeline, we are um, heading for those four first. So this is a very simple sample workflow. Um, NHS Hospital identifies a pathogen via Moldytoff, um, thinks it requires typing, sends it to the uh, OPPATH lab that use PFG. They run the typing and send the result back to the hospital. Now, in increasing, well, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the alternative whole genome sequencing, just changing that to a whole genome sequencing service, we already increase the opportunity for contamination to happen because we've changed from a simple workflow to, these are the wrong slides, hospital, <laughs> hospital changes, uh, sends the moldy toft sample to the Oppath lab who then have to extract, prepare, and send it to the central sequencing lab, um, who then have to unpack, prepare, put it in a new plate, run it through the automated library prep um, procedures. It then goes through our sequencing pipeline, a friendly bioinformatician eyeballs the results, and reports it back to the Oppath lab, who interpret it, and then send it back to the hospital. So you can see we've already got a, different, a new labs situation where we've increased the opportunity for contamination to happen. So this is a very simple pipeline workflow and something else that we could, was our pipeline workflow, and it's something else that we need to really um, think about when we're building our pipeline is what methods are most vulnerable for um, low levels of contamination. Um, we'd argue that our MLST and KMA finder where we uh, map directly, like Camus and Reads, to reference sequences are probably going to be less vulnerable than um, the AOMR Finder Plus and MASH sketches and distance analysis that require an assembly genome, so that indirect um, technique. The MASH uh, distance is the important part of our pipeline and it's where we really wanted to concentrate on catching the contamination because it's where we do the distance analysis and so we wanted to see how much would be too much for um, 
our results with, with regards to low level of contamination. Our first, gene, uh, sorry, our first contamination check is in the form of genome size. We originally used this to prepare our test data sets for validation. Um, we got together 360 samples from each of the four main genera, so the Burkholderia, Serratia, Enterococcus, and Enterobacter. Um, and we assembled them, and we checked them using Quast and Sanger assembly check. And all those that were outside of the um, expected genome ranges were ditched because they were indicative of a contaminated sample. Um, we then took all our samples and compared them to reference sequences using average nucleotide identity. So ANI is uh, the in silico version of DNA-DNA hybridization, which is a wet lab, uh, a wet lab technique for um, the gold standard for speciation. So we were really just making sure that the samples that we had that were actually the species that we thought they were to make a nice big uh, data set. Um, we then wrote that into the pipeline. It's a nice simple check um, if you have an assembly and you know what species you're expecting. Um, the NCBI provide a, a range of genome sizes. So if we have, um, we have a section of the pipeline whereby if the genome is slightly low, or is, it doesn't fall into the range, then it's flagged. We use a traffic light system and the uh, pipeline. It's, it, it comes out in the results. So the genome size was good, um, but at 5% and below, it started to struggle at picking up the contamination. And we thought, well, is 5% OK? Is, can we tolerate 5% in our results? What difference will that make? So we built ourselves an in silico contamination data set, and we took an entry back to HomeHI, and we replaced it with varying levels of E. coli and Klebsiella aeruginis. aeruginis. Um, we also did the same with Enterobacter cloci and Enterococcus vesium in different levels of um, replacement. And we ran this contamination data set through our MASH distance analysis. So, as I said, the important part of our pipeline that looks at the relationship between the samples, which kind of mimics the typing from the PFG. Um, that's a horrible heat map to pull apart. I have a subset at the moment. <laughs> but that was um, what came out. And, um, basically, we can, the dark... Dark squares are where the samples are more related, and as the lighter squares, it's the distance becomes further, and that means that the samples, oh, it's the samples are not as related as those in the dark. This is a subset um, which kind of shows our results better. Um, we have one um, Enterobacter homoechi, which is the green square, and this is the one that's been replaced with E. coli in varying levels, which are the red squares and Klebsiella, which are the blue squares. And we have 15 Enterobacter homoechi uh, representative samples. Um, and if we concentrate on that top left dark brown square where those samples have clustered together, they're, they're shown to have a small distance, so they're more related. Um, we can see the original sample with five probably very closely related Enterobacter homoechi. And we can see the 0.1, 0.5, and 1% contaminated samples. So we could possibly say that we could tolerate maybe up to 1% of contaminated reads in our sequencing data. However, if we go to the bottom right-hand side of the square, we see the two dark, two dark squares at the bottom. Uh, bottom right, sorry. Um, that's where our 2% contamination hits. So in, in a real-world situation, we could have... Um, two patients with the same strain of bacteria. Um, it can be a transmission event, start of an outbreak. But what, we, what we'll see is if we have got contamination at 2% and above, we won't see those samples sit together. So we won't be able to catch that relationship and we may miss that transmission event. So we have our tolerance that we then want to build into a pipeline. Um, we don't want anything above 1% getting through. We want to catch any contamination 1% of our reads being caught. And the way we've done that, or the way we're working on doing that currently, is using a different flavor of MASH called MASH Screen. Um, and this uses uh, reference sequences to speciate what's in your sample data, and um, uh, we use a RefSeq database. So um, how do we build that into a pipeline? How do we get a threshold using MASH Screen um, that will uh, compare with our 1% of reads? Uh, the in silico data set was run through 
mash screen, um, the param parameter of um, the identity value was um, compared to 0.95, we could catch most contamination at 1%. So from a pipeline basis, basically what that means is if we run something through mash screen and we have an output that has more than one species at 0.95% and above, we can be quite confident that we've got contamination within that sample. And that's just a summary of the results where we put through the, uh, the in silico contamination data set through the mash screen. Um, the red just shows where mash screen didn't pick up. So, you know, we've still got some work to do and some thinking to do, but most, most cases at 1% and above were caught by the mash screen. So we now have our mash screen and our genome size check in our pipeline. Um, and it's, uh, it's a bit of a work in progress, um, but it is, it is quite important. Uh, we, we started looking into this quite quickly when our central sequencing library um, started to uh, fail our negative extraction controls. And what we actually found was that it was possibly not uh, environmental or a reagent, it was just the one-off in the plate. So we thought we'd look into how we could catch that contamination uh, bioinformatically and analytically and not have to repeat the extractions of all the samples and then repeat the sequencing. And, um, so that's, that's where we are at the moment. Caveats, this is a very limited data set. This is a very early stage project. Um, we are currently running more validation data sets. We are currently uh, looking at uh, actually replacing a couple of the modules within the pipeline. So again, we'll have to look at how that works with the contamination. Um, again, as I said, we're only looking at the four main um, genera. So species specific behavior, uh, bacteria never really behave. Um, so we may have to tweak thresholds when it comes to increasing those, um, those new species as we bring them into the pipeline. Plasmids and other mobile elements will affect the genome size. That's a piece of work that's being done at the moment. And database curation, um, we've had to rebuild our RefSeq database. Um, and that, yeah, it's just important to know that what you've got your pipeline built on is actually relevant for your, for your outputs. Just want to say thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm really pleased to be here. I think it's a really important um, initiative. Um, and I'd love to say a massive thank you to the team back at home, uh, David, Melissa, Constantino, Walid, and Jack, who worked so hard on this project, especially Melissa, because she's actually, she was born and raised in Cape Town. Um, so she's quite pleased I'm here. <laughs> so thank you for listening.